Okay, good. Um, let's make a formal start. It's a great pleasure to introduce Alistair Curry to come and speak to us this evening. The subject of the tonight's talk is Population Matters. I'm sure Alistair is going to tell us a lot more about it and uh, I'm going to pass over to uh, Alistair just to say uh, the event is being recorded at some point. Hopefully if everything goes well I may be able to upload it to YouTube. Okay, great. Uh, Alistair, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks Brian uh, and thanks um, everyone for, ha for having me and for inviting Population Matters. Um, as we were just talking about before, I'm, I'm a vegan myself of nearly 30 years um, and my uh, professional background, I worked for a number of years in animal rights, including at PETA and Viva and some others. So um, uh, London Vegans, is, when, the, when the talk came up, I said, I'm having that one. <laughs> and, uh, what, one of the, um, and one of the things we, we, we very much find actually is there is, we've got a much higher proportion of, of vegans amongst our support than, than it's average in the population. I think it's something that, that people who've got an understanding that the world doesn't begin and end with human beings, I think are particularly, um, uh, sort of um, uh, recognize uh, these issues um, these issues and the importance of population and um, the whole um, area of, of sort of you know sustainable consumption which is really really central to it is obviously something that that, that many vegans are, are, are deeply concerned about as, as I was just saying you know the, the the increase in veganism which which we've all seen um, you know recently is is fantastic and certainly as an organization we promote um, that more sustainable lifestyles, including plant-based diets. We can't quite go all the way and promote veganism um, at the moment, but more plant-based diets. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I would always like to hope that people come from an animal rights and animal welfare background in that. But so long as, as long as they're they're not eating meat, that's. Fine. I should say that's my personal view here. Uh, um, at Population Matters, we um, uh, we are saying plant-based diets. Anyway, what I'm going to do is a presentation um, here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen um, for that. I think, I think the plan will be questions at the end, um, ideally, which I'm obviously very happy to take. Um, so I may, I may skip through uh, some of these, but uh, I think it's probably the best way of kind of talking about who we are and what we're doing. So pardon me. Uh, right. Um, so yeah, let me just tell you a, a bit about Population Matters. We've been going for nearly 30 years. Next year is our anniversary. Started off very much as a, a, as a think tank. Didn't really sort of get going properly until about 2011 when we became a registered charity. Um, and was very small for quite a long time. Um, and uh, my, uh, my, when I was appointed, I was only the third full-time employee. Since then, that was in 2016, we've now grown to 11 employees which is really fantastic to be part of and just shows how much interest is growing and these are the things that we do i think you can read what our vision um is there uh, and it is essentially about decent lives for everyone on a healthy planet and it's our firm belief that population growth is preventing us from achieving that uh, and that if we can and we can um, end reverse population growth through positive means then people will benefit from that hugely so what we do yeah, we campaign for changes um, so for instance we are working just now to try and get recognition of the impact of population on biodiversity in uh, the new um, framework that's governing biodiversity globally and I'll talk a little bit more about that later um, and the, the idea of our campaign is to is to open the open up opportunities for solutions um, there and clear away um, some of the obstacles to those and we'll talk about those later really critical to what we do is informing this is still an issue that people don't under, uh, understand very well I think intuitively people often understand it but but the detail and the facts, there's an awful lot um, that, go, that, that goes on there and people need to know in order to make decisions. We do research uh, at the moment that is mostly sort of um, um, secondary research, drawing together information from different sources and, um, uh, and disseminating that where it's, uh, where it's relevant. Um, but we, are, we do do some primary research again. Uh, and the last thing that we have here is empower, and we empower in a number of ways. One is by informing people and encouraging them to, to make positive choices. The other is we do some work with 
grassroots family planning and empowerment organizations uh, we are, uh, um, to actually help on the ground with some of the, uh, some of the issues there. Uh, and it's work that we're very proud of. Um, it's a relatively small part. We, we give small grants of about £5,000 um, to organizations in the UK and, uh, and abroad. But, but these small, efficient organizations can work wonders um, with, with those grants. So that's us. Uh, this is Bigfoot. Um, so the unfortunate thing about photographs of Bigfoot is when you look at them, he could be six inches high. He's actually about six feet high. Um, and uh, we commissioned him about three years ago as really as a sort of way of, of representing what we're about. Um, and if you can see closely on the picture of his head, he's actually made of a mesh of steel babies. Um, and the and he is standing on the earth um, with big feet uh, and squashing it uh, and actually it's hard to see from the photograph but he's picking a sort of goo of squashed animals off his uh, uh, off his you know, off his foot there um, and some people might you know might feel that's quite a kind of sort of negative kind of message but we're very much not about negative messages and uh, and what we find when we take Bigfoot out is people instantly understand it they get it you add more people to the planet it's putting more pressure on the natural world and that we really have very little difficulty. Most people respond really, really well to Bigfoot. As we'll talk about, we're certainly not anti-baby. I'm a parent myself and many of us who work at Population Matters are. But that basic message about our numbers are, are, are causing damage to the planet, I think is one that people readily understand. And many of you will be familiar with this graph. Until about the time of Napoleon, there were never more than a billion people on Earth at the same time. Um, and uh, and partly due to the uh, Industrial Revolution, better nutrition, all those kinds of things, our, um, our population has rocketed. I'm 57, the population has more than doubled in my lifetime. Um, I did a, a radio interview the other day, and before that they played What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, which came out in 1970 or 1971, and it's incredible to think the population had doubled in, in the time that, that song has been out. Um, and that, I think this graphic is one that people respond to a, a great deal. It kind of puts some, some flesh on the bones, if you like, of the, uh, of, of the basic figures about our increase. What this shows is the change that has been in just the last 10,000 years in the balance. And this is the weight of, of vertebrate animals, not numbers, but the weight overall. And, and 10,000 years ago, which is obviously the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms, only 1% of the, of the mass of human being, uh, of vertebrates with human beings and now it's now essentially between one percent and three percent is is wild animals we've completely reversed that situation and of course everyone from london vegans will be very conscious of the fact that that our livestock are one of the one of the major contributions um to that overtaking the world and the, and the effects that, that come from that but it, it really is quite shocking to think of that change the curve that I showed you earlier on showed what's happened historically. Um, so the next question is, is what's happening now? Where's that, where's that going to go to? And many people might have heard, and certainly you might have heard because it was a BBC story or a story about this last week, that population is about to start shrinking soon or about plateauing. It's almost certainly not. Um, these are the projections from the United Nations. According to the United Nations, there's only a one in four chance of population growth ending before the end of this century in 80 years time. As you can see, the curve is flattening, but, uh, but it's not expected to flatten before the end of the century. Now, there was some, some, some recent research that came out and that was well covered in the media, suggesting that actually the population is gonna plateau in about, um, in about 40 years. Um, it's possible, um, but, but at the moment, that's not, a, that's not the, the main projection that most people go with. And the point to say about even that projection is it shows our population reaching 9.6 billion. We're currently at 7.8. That's 2 billion more people on the planet over the next 40 years, a planet which is stretched and struggling as it is. So why does population matter? It doesn't matter just because of numbers of human beings. It matters because of the, uh, of the impact that we have. Um, on the earth uh, and um, this picture represents our consumption and clearly for me our consumption and what we do is incredibly important but anyone who believes that the consumption isn't also a factor of the number of consumers no matter what we do only has a small part of the picture we increase the number of us we all need land we all need 
food, we all need earth, we all need water, we all need infrastructure, we all need energy. Now, many of us take far, far more than, uh, than our fair share of those things, but nevertheless, uh, and we must reduce and become more sustainable in that, but nevertheless, every person being added is going to increase that pressure. And this is an example of it, um, currently using 1.7 Earth's worth of renewable resources. Those are the things that the Earth should be able to regenerate. So it's not finite resources like oil, it's things like wood. Um, it's, th it's things like, according to the Global Footprint Network, they talk about fish, uh, fish stocks, which obviously isn't a phrase that, that any of us would use. Um, it's healthy soil, it's those kinds of things. We're currently using 1.7 planets worth. So each year, we're, we're, we're decreasing the ability of the Earth to, to regenerate because we're already taking more than it can provide. So that goes down every year and we'll be needing three Earths worth of renewable resources if we carry on. And as I spoke about earlier on, it's really important to be conscious that, that the distribution and the responsibility for that is, is not distributed evenly. Um, if everyone lived as Americans do, we need five Earths. But I don't think we have much room for complacency when if everyone lived as we do, we need three Earths. Um, uh, and so, again, that shows the vital importance of changing the way that we live, uh, as well as our numbers. But it was also relevant to talk about, and this is very important, the numbers of us. People, when people talk about population, people sometimes think that that refers only to places like Africa, where population is growing hugely. It doesn't, because the impact that we have in the rich part of the world is, is hugely greater uh, than it is in other places. And we need to think about both our behaviour and our numbers. So um, going on to talk about animals, uh, another um, uh, graphic we use, which people tend to respond uh, strongly to, um, that uh, I mentioned before about our population having doubled since 1970, and an animal populations have halved. That's the number of animals, not the number of species, but the, no but the number, uh, number of animals. It's not just cause and effect, of course, there's many things going on, but it really is important to think about how much biodiversity that we're losing. Uh, and, and these quotes on here really sum it up. I have to say that, that having started this job as my first time working in the environmental field, um, I really had no sense of the gravity of our environmental crisis until I started doing this job and these kinds of reports came across my desk on a regular basis. And biodiversity is very much the, the, the neglected cousin of, of um of climate change. Climate change is an existential crisis and it's urgent that we deal with it and I'll talk about that more in a little bit but I am every bit as terrified of, of biodiversity loss as I am of, um, of, of climate change and in fact more so I think human beings will survive climate change no matter what happens. We can't survive if we lose all the, uh, if we lose all the insect pollinators or if we lose the earth on which we depend. It's a massive crisis. One million species at risk of extinction and this IPBS global assessment is the most authoritative and important assessment that's taken place in the last 10 years. Um, it identifies one of the drivers of our extinction loss as being population growth uh, and it makes a really clear statement that we need transformative change to address indirect drivers. There's no point in dealing with things like habitat loss if the drivers of those things are still are still continuing. This is one of the most important conclusions that's been made by um, by authoritative scientific bodies. And I talked about there what the primary reason, there are many, but the, the primary reason for, for um, biodiversity loss is conversion of habitat and it's also exploitation. And again, obviously speaking to, to, to London vegans, we'll be very conscious of, of the effect of that. Um, uh, but I think this, this, this middle quote um, about 75% um, of uh, all species that have gone extinct since AD 1500 were harmed by either over-exploitation or agricultural activity or both. Agricultural activity obviously depends on consumption choices that people make, um, but more people need more food. Uh, and this was summed up beautifully in, in another piece of research, uh, as the greatest health and environmental challenges of the 21st century. And for those who aren't familiar with it, the Eat Lancet report, which came out a couple of years ago, massive report, um, talked about um, what we need to do to address food. Uh, and, uh, and what it said was that there's no way we can feed everyone unless we have what it called transformative change in the way that we produce consume and distribute food. And the main change you'll be unsurprised to hear identified was moving to a more plant-based diet, um, which we know is fundamentally important. 
But what's also fundamentally important is that, is that this massive piece of research concluded that, okay, we do all those things, we can feed 10 billion people, which is where we expect the population to be in about 40 years. But even then, if we increase above 10 billion, and the UN projections are that we will increase, increase above 10 billion, we might be able to feed everyone, but we can't do it sustainably. We can't do it without, without destroying the natural environment. Um, and that is what the word is there. It's unsustainable. It threatens all of us. So, uh, and in particular, I don't have the slide here, but, but the, the increase in demand in food, the primary reason for an increase in demand in food in calories is population growth. It, yes, we, I think we all know that people are changing their diets uh, and that as people become more affluent, their tendency is to eat more meat. And that's something which is very worrying when you look at places like India and China. But population growth is one of the most significant factors in driving that because we all need to eat. Uh, then going on to climate change. Climate change is complicated. Um, uh, and there are many factors contributing to climate change. But again, population is one of them. You add people, you add climate emitters. We all have to be responsible for, for, for climate emissions. And it's not just about emissions as well, but by the things that we consume, obviously we produce emissions, but also things like we just, in the picture that I just showed a, a little while ago, when we convert land for agricultural, per, agricultural purposes, then that leads to things like deforestation, which also impact on the ability of the earth to absorb CO2 and deal with climate change. So it's not just uh, uh, about emissions. Um, and when we think about, again, the theme I addressed earlier on, which was about um, uh, inequality in the way that we handle things. And if you look at the, um, uh, the graphic on the right, um, that's consumption emissions per person. Uh, consumption emissions are not just the ones that are made within the country, but if we import food or anything else, then we are kind of responsible for, for, for the emissions that, that may be generated abroad, but if we're consuming that stuff, that, that, then we can. And there's no huge surprises when you look at that, the consumption emissions, you know, the US, um, Australia, um, and uh, some Arab states hugely um, uh, disproportionately producing um, uh, um, uh, climate emissions or responsible for emissions, very little uh, taking place in Africa and many other places which are poor. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, you look at the graph on the left uh, and that looks at CO2 con consumption emissions per country and the picture looks a little bit difficult, different there and you'll see that one of the principal, the two principal things in red there are India and China. Both India and China are increasing their affluence, they both use dirty fuels, uh, um, particularly India in using coal, so it's not simply about population. But these are the only countries in the world with more than a billion people in them each. And that is one of the reasons why, why their emissions are so, are so high. The number of, of emitters matters. Um, uh, and then these two, two graphs um, look at, again, that inequality. So some of these, these figures are a few years old, actually, but, um, uh, and they change slightly. But in principle, a person being born in the US is going to be responsible for um, about 150 times the amount of emissions of someone produced in Niger. And you look on the other side, fertility rates, that's a, that's a measure, largely speaking, of, of um, family size. So the reason that Niger is on, is on the map on CO2 emissions is because it has the highest fertility rate in the world, around about seven children per woman, per woman on average. Um, but its contribution to climate change is absolutely negligible. And if you want to look at it, it the other way uh, the other way around although the us and the uk our fertility rates are way lower our family size are way lower one fewer american being born is of more value to the planet in climate change terms than 150 people from niger being born that's the difference and so the choices that we make in the developed world about our family size are really important in that respect um, and this map uh, this this graphic shows just how much of a difference it can make um, and again, I, I'm conscious I'm talking to vegans, uh, and you'll be scanning this to look at uh, um, where, where carbon dioxide is saved, and you'll see, see choose a vegan diet um, there, um, uh, which is up on, the, on the right um, as what, one, two, three, four, five, sixth in the, uh, in the list of things you can do as individuals. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with other figures. There's not an exact science um, in this. And I would also say the have one fewer child graphic, which shows it's clearly the most um, effective thing we can do. There is some sort of, um, there's a slightly complex picture there. This essentially includes the 
uh, emissions of offspring um, as, uh, 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 and you're not just your children but their children so, so in the way it's calculated it doesn't mean that if you if you if you choose a vegan diet for instance on these figures next year and you're not already vegan you'll save 0.82 tons of carbon if you have one fewer child you won't save 58.6 tons of carbon in that year that's spread out over a period so i think a more useful way of looking at it um are, the, are these figures which are um uh, uh, which is the same sort of principle but they only talk about what actually happens within a year uh, again these figures are, are, are a little bit old because those those could be changed but essentially it still shows that having one fewer child is one of the most effective things that we can take but of course actions we can take that does not in any way mean that we shouldn't be doing any of the others but what's clear about climate change we've got a 10-year window to fix climate change. The reality is actually that, that changes in family size and, popu uh, and population. If people have fewer children now, it takes a generation or so for that really to kick in significantly in terms of the change of, of numbers of people and numbers of consumers. We mustn't think that climate change is gonna go away in 10 years time if we do manage to fix it. Just now, it's not. Um, so it's very important that we future-proof any positive changes that we make just now by helping to reduce the number of climate emitters. But it is, so the other things, fossil fuels, changes in, in diet, all those things are absolutely essential. We have to do all these, um, but, but the size of our families matters. Um, and in fact, uh, that's a picture of Big Baby, again, is another prop that you can't really tell the size of. It's about seven meters high. Uh, and we took into Parliament when the COP um, meeting was on last year, COP climate change meeting. Um, and he has that thing saying, guess my weight in CO2. He's filled with helium. If he was filled with carbon dioxide, you'd need 50 of those big babies at seven meters high to, to cover the amount of CO2 that in the UK we're each responsible for every year. And I think that does help to give some sort of scale to, to what, we're, what we're doing. And on a global level, not just on an individual level, it's really important. Project Drawdown it was a, uh, a piece of, big piece of international research looking at what are the options that we've got today that help us address, um, help us bring climate emissions down as quickly as possible. Not things that might happen in the future, what can we do today? From the 2017 research, there are, of these options, if you combine these two things, family planning and educating girls, as we'll talk about later, you do those and you reduce family size and you reduce um, population growth. And when I say you reduce, you do those two things and women choose to have smaller families. Uh, and that applies across the board and we'll, and we'll talk about it more later. So those two actions of, of improving women's lives um, and indeed people's lives with family planning together had a bigger impact on climate change overall than all, than all onshore and offshore wind turbines combined. Again, you'll see obviously on there, plant-rich diet. That didn't evaluate veganism, it talked about um, uh, a more plant-rich diet. These figures have been updated actually since we did this graphic, they're slightly different now. In fact, food waste now comes out as the number one issue for addressing, uh, addressing climate change, but still women's empowerment is really high. Which leads us on to solutions. So I've been talking about the, the, the problems and the contributions, um, uh, the, the problems that arise from high population. And now let's talk about how we fix it. And this is a really critically important graph. You recall that, that I showed one uh, earlier on talking about what United Nations projections are. This shows the same United Nations projections, but on the basis that fertility rate, basically family size, goes down by either half a child each on average per family or goes up by half a child each per average on fa uh, per family uh, above what the UN expects at the moment and you'll see that if it goes up slightly then we're looking at 16 billion people uh, by the end of the century if it goes down just very slightly we're looking at a smaller population than we have today that's an incredible difference and you think about it half a child less per family is not very much to do so this is a very achievable um, thing to do so how does that come about? Well, these are the things that, that lead to smaller families and reduction in population. Uh, end poverty, empower women and girls, education. That means education, quality education for everyone, not just education about family planning, but education. When people stay in school longer, particularly women and girls, they have fewer kids, uh, or they rather they choose fewer kids. Modern family planning, planning is clearly absolutely essential. There's no point in doing any of these other things unless people can actually access and freely use family planning that works. And I think it might be on the ne next slide. Um, 
talks about this approximately 270 million women in the world still have what, an unmet need for contraception. They would prefer not to be, um, they would choose not to be pregnant, but they aren't currently taking contraception that would prevent that. So there's a huge need there. And then the last thing is promoting small families. What, what we do, in, informing people about the value of having small families, about the importance and the contribution uh, uh, that it can make. Uh, and that really is important. Uh, many people, particularly people who are poor or under, uh, uh, under pressure or whose circumstances lead to them to having larger families already want to choose smaller families and they just need to be enabled to do so. But largely within the developed world, within the UK, largely we've done the first four of these things. We are free to make that choice and that's why people should, should be aware of the value and importance of doing it, which, which I've spoken about. So yeah, the, the, um, those are the figures actually that, are, that I was speaking about. And there's something really important to look at in these figures, which is, which is if you look, the unmet need for modern family planning is going up. More women today than 30 years ago, uh, um, and there will be more women in 2030 unless we do better. And the reason for that is population growth. Although we are doing slightly better proportionately at getting contraception, at addressing the unmet need, the number of women who need it is going up because of population growth. And you actually see that in many areas. The proportion of girls in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, going to school has gone up. The number of girls not going to school has also gone up because the population has grown. Uh, in many respects, um, you see the same, the same phenomenon occurring. And it's really important to be aware when we talk about percentage changes, if, you're, if the population is growing, it's being affected, those percentage changes may look like an improvement, but actually more people may be suffering as a result. So uh, I talked about exercising the choice um, there where we do have that ability to, um, to choose the size of our families, then that's one that, that I think is, is, is a good choice to make. Um, and I like this quote, Gregory is, um, is, is one of our supporters. Um, I think he's vegan, I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure. Um, people don't have to be vegan to be good people, um, but, but I just thought I would mention that. Um, and he has talked about why they've, they've chosen just to have a, a, a single daughter, he and his, he and his partner. Um, and he said the choice is hard, but doing what's right for the planet rather than ourselves often is hard. Of course, for many people, it's not a hard choice. Many people only want one kid and many people um, don't want to have any kids at all. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. And the child-free choice is a very, very valid choice. Uh, uh, and no one should ever face stigma for taking an action which effectively actually helps other people's children. It helps to make the world more sustainable uh, when people choose to make that choice. And it really works. These things I talked about really work. You look at, at the changes that have made. So South Korea, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Colombia, these are all places where that recipe of women's empowerment, education, um, has, has, been, has been employed. And you see how spectacularly they, they've been able to bring down um, their, their family size. And the, the, the graph on the right, um, what's not on that version, I think, is China's one-child policy. And people often think when you talk about population in terms of that. China's one-child policy coerced people into only having uh, having one child and there are many negative consequences from that including infanticide of girl girl children uh, and abortions um sort of forced abortions people um where they didn't have a choice in that the results of that one child policy are no better and in most cases worse than all these positive policies which uh, which are being shown here it's obviously not right to coerce anyone. It is a fundamental human right to have a family and to choose the size of your family. But as well as it being wrong, you don't need to do it. People will, will make that choice themselves if you allow them to. So this is a picture, by the way, announcing the birth of one of the royal kids. I can't remember. I can't remember which one now. Someone whose impact on the planet will be probably substantially greater than, than most of ours and certainly the kids. Um, uh, in, that we saw earlier on. Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, my job uh, has, has made me sort of much more conscious of what's going on in the world. And, and as part of my job, reports on diet, on climate, on biodiversity come across my desk on a, on a regular basis. And there are two words that over and over and over again come out when you look at those. At those. That's the first one catastrophic, catastrophic biodiversity loss, catastrophic effects from, from climate change. Uh, and it is 
terrifying to see that word occurring so often. But what almost all these, these reports also do is they say we can avert that. But this is the other word that comes up, transformation. That in order to avert, the, avert catastrophe, we have to fundamentally change the way that we're doing things. And so I gave the example earlier on of, of, of food and a transformation in diets and the way that, that, that we distribute food. What is absolutely clear is that business as usual isn't going to cut it. And, when it, and the solutions that we need to employ are solutions across the board. Population, as we've looked at, with, with more people is adding more pressure in all these re in, in all these respects actually the things that we need to do to address po population all the positive things i talked about family planning women women's empowerment so we can make a difference there and we should be making a, a difference in that way allowing people to make to make that choice because it is catastrophe that we're facing unless we do everything in our power as the ipcc put it a couple of years ago nothing can be left off the table at this point Lastly, David Attenborough is one of our patrons who we're very fortunate to have. And really the whole presentation I've just done is actually just summed up in, in this sentence from him. You kind of don't need the rest of it. It's pretty much self-evidently true. You put more people on the planet, it makes it more difficult. If there's less pressure, if there are less carbon emitters, if there are less people needing food, if there are less people needing land, then it makes it easier for the other solutions that we have to implement to do their job. And I think that's it apart from this yes I, I i just found this picture online um and i love it and i think it's a good way to end um so that's the end of my presentation i'm very conscious that it's a very data heavy presentation uh, and we are working on getting a more story-based presentation but i hope you've found that useful and i'd be very happy to take your questions thank you alistair now let's go back to uh to viewing you um I, I hopefully there's some questions out there either you can unmute yourself and ask or if you want to ask in the chat box you're welcome to do so so if anybody has any questions for alistair uh sandra i can see your hand going up can you unmute yourself and uh, ask unmute yourself Hi there, Alistair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, there was an awful lot of data there. there what was, I missed, if you could just say it again, I was interested. Um, how, how many, in terms of, um, if it's um, the consumption, um, that America has got far more consumption per person than... Yeah. Uh, Niger. So in terms of making um, it equal, what is the term, the, the ratio between one American to how many um, people in Niger? I think... Uh, well, that. yeah, the, the, in terms of, uh, of a sort of, um, actually I should say, I, I, I don't know whether anyone's familiar with Earth Overshoot Day. So Earth Overshoot Day is um, it, it's promoted by an organisation called the Global Footprint Network, um, and the data that we're, that I supplied is from the Global Footprint Network. Um, and I strongly recommend looking at, at at their site. So they do this evaluation of um, uh, of, of of impact, looking at looking at across. So it's all metrics. It's it's all it's all numbers um, are on there, uh, and they look at. They, they do it on, a, on an individual country basis. What can that territory provide and what, and what do people need? And they also ask that question about if everyone lived like how much is an average um, American or Nigerian uh, producing. So when it comes to the overall impact, um, it is five Americans, uh, sorry, five Earths needed if everyone acted, uh, was consuming at the same level as the average American. Um, three if everyone was consuming at the same level uh, as an average um, Brit and about one uh, which is a, is a piece of information that surprised me actually I thought Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world their numbers would be below that um, and I queried this with Global Footprint Network and they said no it's correct I shame I can't remember what the reasons are for that so that's overall environmental impact when it comes to um, climate emissions um, the figure on the graph that I showed was about 150 American, uh, 150 times more climate emissions coming from the average American and the average Nigerian. That data is a few years old now, though. I think it's now substantially less. It's something like 100 times more rather than 150. Um, but the, but the, the point obviously remains. Thank you. Uh, 
but, but, but oh, I should say, you know, uh, all the all these all these graphics and information is they're all on our website. Um, we have a facts section on our website, and there's different pages for climate change, biodiversity, all those kinds of things. So um, you can find all, that. and also actually all the graphics that I've shown today are also downloadable from our website as well. If, if people want to share them on their social media or use them in other contexts, which would be very good if they did. Okay, thank you. Thank you. John. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, my question is, do other countries around the world have some equivalent to Population Matters organisations? It's a good question, actually. Um, and it's work, uh, we're literally at this moment doing, doing some work, doing outreach to other countries. So what we know of is there are um, there are very similar organizations to Population Matters in Canada, Australia, a number of them in the United States, um, uh, New Zealand, um, but what and, and a number in Europe, um, not, not identical, but who have a, an overall sort of population uh, interest or concern. Um, what what we really don't really know is how many organizations there are in places in the global south particularly and elsewhere who, are, who have that, that uh, similar interest um, there's a there's a there's actually a list on on wikipedia but some of the organizations on that are already dud and what we suspect is there are there won't there, or there isn't a ugandan organization to the best of our knowledge um, which is the same as population matters but ugandan friends of the earth or uh, you know, or, or an organisation like that will have a very strong sense of, or there will certainly be organisations like that which have a strong sense of the po of population issues, and that's what we're literally doing at the moment. Is we are going out and trying to find those, those people who are interested. So, yeah, within the the you know global North English speaking world, there are certainly organisations like us um, uh, out there, and the States has a number of them um, with slightly different remits. Okay, uh, any other questions? Oh, you got another one, John. <laughs> yes, um, do you have the um, ability to lobby the United Nations at all? Yeah. Uh, we do, and in fact, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you asked that question uh, because just it was World Population Day on the 11th of July, uh, which is a UN um, event, and I, I'd be amazed if any of you have even heard of it. But it, it is actually well known in places which have population well, population growth issues in in um, Africa and Asia and elsewhere um, and for that we produced a report um, on the sustainable development goals and progress towards achieving sustainable development goals and how much population growth is is uh, is inhibiting that uh, and we have uh, we don't have an active presence in the United Nations at the moment. One of the things that you need in order to really be able to do that is to be an international, have it represent an international arena rather than a um, uh, rather than just a national one. So that's part of the reason why we're doing the work I was just talking about in terms of outreach to to, uh, to other countries. Um, so yeah, we can send and do send things into the United Nations and that sort of thing. But if you're going to seriously lobby, you need to be representing um, you know sort of a multinational. Um, uh, kind of platform. Well, thank you. There's a couple of questions we've got. Uh, firstly, uh, I said, given your research and people you've spoken to, are you hopeful we will transform, or are we doomed? <laughs> um, both. Can I answer that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I am hopeful uh, we will transform. I think. The situation is incredibly grave uh, uh, at the moment, um, uh, and it requires. I in, a, in another version of this talk, I, I make a comparison to the sort of threat of nuclear war in the in the nineteen eighties, which I'm certainly old enough to remember. Um, and the issue about nuclear war was that someone needed to make an active decision to launch a nuclear war. But if they did nothing, there wasn't going to be a nuclear war. We're in a reverse situation just now. People need to make an active decision to do something about our, about our crisis. Um, if we do nothing, then we are doomed. Um, I think uh, I think there are signs finally that, that that policymakers are starting to pay attention to this. Um, but I, I I weep for the lack of attention that biodiversity loss gets. It really it really is fundamental. I think it's certainly the case, and even in the four years I've worked at Population Matters, there is much more 
interest and discussion in the notion of people choosing smaller families as a way of helping the earth than there was even four years ago um, you know, when I started. And I think this is a conversation that people are beginning to have more. Um, and I think you look at Extinction Rebellion, you look at kind of obviously it's hard to know what would happen with Extinction Rebellion had we had we not had a lockdown, but the level of interest in environmental issues and particularly climate change zoomed up after Extinction Rebellion and it certainly mobilized people that you would, um, you know, never have imagined would, would, would get involved in this way. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic and as the father of a 10 year old, I have to be optimistic because I hope he's going to be around for the next, and of course he's a vegan, lifelong vegan and going to be around for at least the next 90 years. Mm. So I hope I hope it's a better world for him to live in than will happen unless we do something about it. That's my honest answer. Okay. Uh, another question online was, do you have any target groups whom you try to focus the issue on, like young couples or youth primarily? Yeah, well, I, we, we actually, we just... Um, uh, we just appointed, uh, we uh, were talking about the expansion of our team, um, uh, and we, we appointed someone just a, just a few months ago whose job is specifically um, to do promotion of smaller families, and that is work that's directed at the, the wealthy, primarily English-speaking uh, world, and in particular the UK, and her job is to develop that campaign, and what's really good is she actually comes from a marketing background um as well so yes certainly young adults and, and when we sort of broken up that 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 audience a little bit we're conscious at the moment we don't have a great offer for young adults or, or uh, for, for very young adults you, you see my age <laughs> you know i don't think anyone who works in the organization who's under the age of 30 um and, and we need to be thinking about the best way to, to to talk to that group um but they're clearly those people who haven't yet made a decision about family size are really important but another really important group actually is parents um, because if you have, if you already have kids, then the decision about how many more to have is, is, an, is an important decision for you. In a sense, if you know you want to be a parent, then you're certainly going to, uh, uh, going to be one. But that decision, I know for, you know, for many people, certainly for, for, for myself and, and my wife, the decision to go from, from one to two is a much more kind of marginal decision than the decision to be a parent, which is a big thing. Um, and there are many things that influence people's choices on that. Finance is, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly a, certainly a big one, and it, and it was for us, but there's many influences. Um, but I think it's very important that we don't neglect parents, uh, and that what our message is never an antenatal one. It's never being a parent is bad, having kids is bad, babies are bad, all those kinds of things. Because babies are, babies are great. As one of our patrons put it, um, uh, we love babies, but you can have too much of a good thing, which I think is a really nice way of, uh, of expressing it. Other than, I think you covered this earlier, just uh, what was on the slide. Other than reducing the number of children we have, what's the next most valuable thing we can do? Uh, in, uh, in, gen in general terms, yeah. buy less stuff. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that, that, that's the most, uh, most valuable thing we can do. I mean, certainly, you know, those of us who uh, uh, buy less stuff generally, obviously, yeah, yeah. Diets is really and fundamentally important the way we travel. I think we all know, you know, know the answers. And I think one of the things that, that, that does often come up is we sometimes get um, people going, oh, it's not population, it's consumption, or those kind of things. There's a fight to pick what is the most important problem or the most important solution. Uh, and as I said, I, I, I really like that quote from, from someone from the uh, International Panel on Climate, that no solutions can be left on. We need to do everything. We don't need to pick, pick, pick yeah. one. So if you've heard of it, that it's a good idea, it's worth doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I should say that, you know, it's easy for me to speak, you know, uh, in that way. You see my nice house behind me, you know, it's not like we <laughs> things in my family, but nevertheless, those are the right things. Uh, Vivina, who was, who she spoke to us last month, and that was about minimalism. Um, I think she wanted to say something. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, uh, Alistair, like you've spoken a lot of files about, uh, you know, the impact on biodiversity. But does uh, population matters also, you know, focus on certain uh, traditional kind of a thinking? Like, for example, uh, like when I was a parent, I chose to have a second one because I was fed with the idea that two is good. You should mm -hmm. complete the family. Yeah. So do you find kind of these uh, old values, uh, not exactly old, but these are, you know, if I population matters came to me earlier, probably I would have had a child less. Yeah. But then I was taught the different way. So is it something that they address? I think uh, I... It, it, sorry. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, one of the, you know, the, the actually not just in the UK, but, but in, um, 
in uh, uh, Niger, for instance, or, or Chad, the, 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 the best predictor of family size isn't it, how many kids you want. That's the, that's the best predictor of family size. Um, and it, uh, uh, one, one, um, uh, one, one stat that's always stuck in my head um, was that, and it's, it's a, a few years old, not, not very old, was that in Chad, the desired family size for a man was 13. Uh, as in the number of kids, the, the desired family size for a woman was 10. Um, in reality, actually, the de desired family size in, in Chad at that point was somewhere around six or seven. So, so kind of no one was getting what they want. Um, but I also, it, it's very important to say, even if the women got their way, that would be, you know, that would be an improvement um, uh, on, on, on the situation. And actually, even the, if the women got their way, is actually a really good way of describing solutions to, to population growth, because it's very much driven by those empowerment issues but in answer to your question certainly perceptions about what what a family should look like uh, and just positions and we know that one of the, the most influential things on the choices we all make about about the number of kids we have is in fact our own family and our own background um, uh, and expectations that, that that go along with that but i think what's interesting and it goes back to the question actually about about sort of transformation is i think it's probably the same with every generation but i think particularly now there's much more understanding, I think, than there was a generation ago, that the choices that we make have an impact on other people and that they have an impact on the earth. And the again, you know, I've been vegan for, for nearly 30 years, vegetarian for longer, and I'm sure many of you well remember it wasn't that long ago when being a vegan was just fundamentally weird fundamentally strange and if you spoke to anyone about uh, uh, about their dietary choices it was like hands off my plate you know what was the approach that they made and now my understanding my anecdotally certainly is the main reason that people are choosing to go vegan is for environmental reasons because they've recognized that their choice about what they eat is having an impact on on, on other people and they're not doing the same things as their parents did in, in um in eating meat and i think that what we're definitely seeing is there's more of an understanding of that across the board and in regard to family size so people are less likely to do what their parents did millennials are a group who are, who are more skeptical about about having kids in fact the millennials are, are, are not the youngest generation now about having kids than their parents were um and and across the board everywhere um fertility rates average family size is going down whatever the um uh, and a couple of examples which i think are really important the places in europe the large countries in europe with the lowest fertility rate lowest family size are actually in portugal two catholic countries mm -hmm. then to show that you know that you know that that kind of um, uh, you know sort of cultural sense is not influencing the choices that people are making significantly there. Okay. Uh, just I'll just uh, add one more question. Like even for me, uh, the population matters. It's something of course that is very close to me. And uh, you know, if there is something that I could do, what is that I can do about it? Uh, well, one thing you can do, actually, if, if you live in London, is there is a really good local group in London, Population Matters uh, uh, local group. You can find, um, or you, you, well, you can email me, Brian can give you your details, or you can find them uh, on our website if you just search London. Group. They really are excellent. They're, they're, they're really well organised. They do, obviously, at the moment, there's not that much stuff that they're doing because they're not getting out much more, but they do arrange talks like this. And then the other thing, if... if um, not getting involved sort of directly, directly or actively is on our website, the campaign, the take action page on our website, section on our website with the campaigns, there are various things uh, that you can do then. And another really important thing is just spreading the word. People still don't understand it well enough. It's one of the reasons why the graphics that I showed earlier on, we have them all available for download on website. Follow us on Twitter and share our stuff if you've got social media, um, you, you know, getting that information out to you because there's so many misunderstandings about what's actually going what the benefits are, what the implications are. Right. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. John. Um, yes, hello again. Um, have you had any um, interaction or feedback from either the Mothers Union or the Women's Institute? Uh, no, um, but, but we will, is the answer. <laughs> The fact that we've, we've now we're now expanding our small families campaign and we have a campaigner whose, whose job is to do it specifically and i mentioned before that one of our key audience is 
parents, it's mums, uh, you know, and mums and dads. And certainly that's an audience we want to go out to. And it would be interesting to see what. Yeah. Now, I should say the Women's Institute, we have, I know that, that we've done some talks, lo, not, not myself, but, but some of our local groups have been to Women's Institutes. And Women's Institutes are actually generally pretty interesting places and good places to go and talk to. Um, there and and I think as long as you don't go in in a you know in a judgmental way then then they're interested in the issues and they respond to it but I think I mean what, one of my goals I have to say is that we should uh, we should get a stall at the mother and baby show at Earl's Court whenever those things start again. I can't imagine they'd let us through the door because yeah. these things really exist to sell stuff to parents um but I think that's where we need to be and that, those are the people we need to be talking to so I'll, I'll get back to you on that question you know in a year or so yeah. when we started the work I'm going to ask a personal question. Is there um, factored into your work the effect of natural disasters like COVID-19, yeah. wars, etc.? Because obviously when something like COVID comes along and, and, and populations are being reduced, uh, you could say, well, is that going to have a, a major impact on um, CO2 levels, etc. in the future? I mean, one thing to be clear, and I'm sure everyone understands this anyway, but it's been well expressed, is that, you know, solutions to population are about are not about speeding up the exits, they're about slowing down the entrances. <laughs> and very clearly, we want everyone who is born to lead a long, happy, healthy life. Uh, and, and I hope that that goes without saying. Um, it's, I mean, one of the things that you do actually find is that there is there's a pretty strong correlation, actually, between crisis and birth rate going up. So following hurricanes, you know, in poor countries, um, war obviously in, in time, you know, I mean, the classic baby boom in time, in the time of war, um, then, then people are much more, if they've got the power, then they're much more concerned. But then afterwards you get, you get a baby boom like you did in the UK, but in many other places, crises um, affect people's uh, ability, particularly access to family planning uh, and people, people's power. And one of the things about COVID-19, I mean, obviously, um, well, we know that we know the death figures because we, because we're seeing them. But probably, un unless things get get much worse, it's not going to have much of an effect on on, mort on mortality average across the 7.8 billion people uh, in the earth. Where it is having an effect already is in the provision of those services and good things that help people to to control their fertility and make decisions about about their family size. So already family planning aid in particular to, to poor places has, has been under a lot of pressure in recent years it's one of the things undoubtedly that 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 is going to suffer and so so people who want not to be pregnant are going to find it more difficult to make that choice as a result of COVID-19 and what we may actually see is it is a bump because of this certainly in some places where health systems are vulnerable uh, or indeed uh, the other things about education all elite poverty alleviation, when, when the economy is, go, is going down, it's more difficult to alleviate poverty. And again, people, the, the, the link with poverty is fairly obvious in many ways. If you live in a place where you can't rely or you don't have economic stability, you can't rely on the government to provide a safety net um, where your work comes from, what, what your income comes from, what you can do. Kids make sense. Having more kids makes sense as a, as a kind of insurance policy. Um, and also, unfortunately, where people have higher more child mortality, having more kids makes sense. Once people are, aren't as poor, they don't need as many kids. Um, so, it's, so that's why poverty alleviation is so important. So there is a real threat from COVID-19 and, as I say, for, you know, from other crises and disasters actually pushing birth rates up. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass the last question to John again. Yes, you, um, you featured earlier um, one of your patrons, David Attenborough. Now, I know he's produced a film which was supposed to come out in April called A Life on Our Planet, yeah. which will deal with the issues of the, the rising human population and yeah. farm animal population. It was cancelled with cancelled because of the COVID instead yeah. of the closing. Do you know anything about when it might come out? No, I don't. Um, yeah, we're, we're kind of keen to see it too. It's uh, WWF. Um, are, are closely involved. WWF have got a slightly ambivalent position when it comes to population. They kind of, they recognise it's an issue, but they prefer not to talk about it because it's quite a controversial um, area. And I think I get the impression that David Attenborough has kind of pushed for its inclusion because he considers it, 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 it to be important. So we're not sure how much there's going to be, but we know that there is going to be, uh, be it. But yeah, I don't know when it's happening. We were, we were hoping to see it ourselves. So sorry, I can't help on that one. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you, John. Thank you, participants. And a very big thank you to Alistair for joining us this evening. Very enlightening. It's a subject I knew very little about, which I now know a fair more about. So thank you ever so much for joining us.